Hello, everyone. We're just uh, waiting a few minutes for this uh, people to trickle in. I know Zoom is a slow start, but that's okay. We're here. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our guests. Um, and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna begin our conversation in about one minute. All right. Wonderful. Okay. All right, I'm gonna actually start right now. Let's, let's, let's do it. Hi, I'm Ryan Cook, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another exciting virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to mcnallyjackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs that we're hosting in the coming weeks. Please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's going on. And there will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for questions, so start thinking about them now. And you can put all your questions in the Zoom chat. If you're a little too shy, you can private message them to me, and I'll say it's from Anonymous. But either way, that works out. Um, so we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. Um, and we're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host the event during this difficult time. I mean, we weathered through a pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping. So indie bookstores like ours need more support. Um, if, you're for, if you like our events like this one and want to keep host, us to keep hosting more of them, please buy some books. I'm going to be posting the event, uh, uh, tonight's events books in the chat tonight, as well as a lovely review from the New York Times that just one of our esteemed writers was just mentioned in. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be posting that all in the chat that you can click. Um, but yeah, so the, your, the book links will link you and then you can buy them online. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. <clears throat> Our first um, guest is Anne McCutcheon. It, she is the author of six works of biography and memoir, including Marcel Moise, A Voice of Flute, and Where's the Moon? A Memoir of the Space Coast and Florida Dream. She is the founding director of the University of Wyoming's MFA in Creative Writing program and the former editor of the Literary, American Literary Review. McCutcheon grew up in Florida and now lives in Wyoming. Our next our next guest is Leslie Brody, is the biographer. She's a biographer, playwright, and professor of creative writing. She adapted Harriet the Spy for stage in 1988 and is a recipient of the National Endowments of the Art and Penn America Award for Creative Nonfiction. She has been an on-staff on book columnist for Elle magazine and lives in Redlands, California. <clears throat> and our last guest, last but not least, is Liesl Skill, Schillinger, Schillinger, there you go, is a New York-based uh, New York based critic translator and teaches journalism and criticism at the New School. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, and many others. She translates fiction, nonfiction from German, French, and Italian. Her recent works uh, translated include Stella, um, The Psycho Psychology of Stupidity, um, and Garden of Monsters. She's the author of the book, World Birds, an illustrated lexicon of necessary neologisms for the 21st century. Alrighty, so I'm gonna open up the floor for conversations and yeah, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Ryan. And hello, Anne and hello, Leslie. Um, it's pretty thrilling to be talking to you both uh, tonight um, on the eve of the publication of Anne's book, The Life She Wished to Live, a biography of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Uh, it comes out tomorrow by Norton, but it got a thrilling review today uh, in the New York Times by uh, Dwight Garner. And I just wanted to give you a fun line of his about this miraculous woman, Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, who got the Pulitzer for her book, The Yearling, which maybe some of you have read uh, back in 1939. Uh, but who may be underknown today. So here is what Dwight Garner wrote. He said, it's a pleasure to meet this cursing, hard drinking, brilliant, self-destructive, car wrecking, fun loving, chain smoking, alligator hunting, moonshine making, food obsessed woman, again on the page. Might have added book writing, but anyway. Um, so uh, the woman had a lot of personality. And when the two of us uh, spoke earlier this weekend, we discussed the fact that we think that a lot of our 
audience, a lot of readers are probably familiar with uh, the subject of Louise Fitzhugh, the author of Harriet the Spy. Uh, and, you know, there's an absolutely a wonderful biography. I'm pulling this down. Sometimes You Have to Lie, which I got to review for the Times last December. Uh, Leslie's biography of Louise Fitzhugh, author of Harriet the Spy. But I figure a lot of us maybe don't really know as much. I don't have as big an idea of what The Yearling was all about. It was a movie with Gregory Peck, nonetheless. Uh, and, you know, the book, it won the Pulitzer and it was beautiful, but I had not read it until I read it so that I would know what Anne was writing about. And so, um, I was going to show you a fun little cheat sheet to give you a taste of who Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings was. Uh, and I'll do the same thing for Leslie when I ask her her question. But I just think we all would, wouldn't mind getting to see a little bit of this, this uh, alligator shooting uh, novelist so we can know what she's like. Here we go. Uh, okay, just showing a few pictures. So that's the demure young damsel Marjorie Kinnon, whose mother want, was a social climbing wannabe, uh, wanted her daughter to be a debutante, uh, but she, she bristled against that. She liked her father's farm in Maryland, grew up in DC, Maryland around that, went to University of Wisconsin where she was notorious for wearing bright red lipstick, which nice girls didn't do, but she did it, right? Now remember, when she was in her late teens, women didn't have the vote. So this is not Louise Fitzhugh's world. You know, Louise Fitzhugh was born in 1928, and she was rocking it in the 50s and 60s, being very free. But this woman was born in different times, but she lived as if she lived in the time she chose, right? So here she is on her farm in Florida, where she did her important writing of the yearling, uh, hunting crab on a boat, gigging crabs, maybe it's called. And that's her farm, Cross Creek. And there she is with her second husband. Her first husband was too jealous of her, so she just said, get out, it's over. But they remained friends. So that's her second husband. She loved hunting. There she is talking to one of the local people in the scrub country in Florida. She talked to them, she got their stories. And there she is on a postage stamp. So there you go. And if you didn't know her, people did. And then finally, here she is talking to Margaret Mitchell, the author of Gone with the Wind, who got the Pulitzer for her novel set in the South two years before uh, Marjorie did. So that's enough of my show and tell. And now I just thought I would go to Anne and say, do you want us to give us a taste of her writing before I start asking you about stuff? Oh, I would love it. Um, that's one of my hopes for this biography is to, um, you know, increase, bring her back, you know, so people will, will enjoy her writing. It's so gorgeous. And, and I've said to so many of my writer friends that her sentences are, are music. They're such pleasure. So um, I'll read a scene uh, from The Yearling. Um, it's, uh, we call it the Dance of the Cranes, and Jody um, and his father, Penny Baxter, are on a fishing trip uh, in the scrub, in, in the swamps, and, um, and his father calls his attention to these birds. So here we are, about three paragraphs describing the cranes they see in the swamp. <clears throat> Jody saw the great white birds in the distance. His father's eye, he thought, was like an eagle's. They crouched on all fours and crept forward slowly. Now and then, Penny dropped flat on his stomach and Jody dropped behind him. They reached a clump of high sawgrass and Penny motioned for concealment behind it. The birds were so close that it seemed to Jody he might touch them with his long fishing pole. Penny squatted on his haunches and Jody followed. His eyes were wide. He made a count of the whooping cranes. There were 16. The cranes were dancing a cotillion as surely as it was danced at Volusia. Two stood apart, erect and white, making a strange music that was part cry and part singing. The rhythm was irregular, like the dance. The other birds were in a circle. In the heart of the circle, several moved counterclockwise. The musicians made their music. The dancers raised their wings and lifted their feet, first one and then the other. They sunk their heads deep in their snowy breasts, lifted them, and sunk again. They moved soundlessly, part awkwardness, part grace. The dance was solemn. Wings fluttered, rising and falling like outstretched arms. The outer circle shuffled around and around. The group in the center attained a slow frenzy. Suddenly, all motion ceased. 
Jody thought the dance was over or that the intruders had been discovered. Then the two musicians joined the circle. Two others took their places. There was a pause. The dance was resumed. The birds were reflected in the clear marsh water. 16 white shadows reflected the motions. The evening breeze moved across the sawgrass. It bowed and fluttered. The water rippled. The setting sun lay rosy on the white bodies. Magic birds were dancing in a mystic marsh. The grass swayed with them and the shallow waters and the earth fluttered under them. The earth was dancing with the cranes and the low sun and the wind and the sky. Jody found his own arms lifting and falling with his breath as the crane's wings lifted. The sun was sinking into the sawgrass. The marsh was golden. The whooping cranes were washed with gold. The far hammocks were black. Darkness came to the lily pads and the water blackened. The cranes were whiter than any clouds or any white bloom of oleander or of lily. Without warning, they took flight. Whether the hour-long dance was simply done or whether the long nose of an alligator had lifted above the water to alarm them, Jody could not tell, but they were gone. They made a great circle against the sunset, whooping their strange rusty cry that sounded only in their flight. Then they flew in a long line into the west and vanished. That is so beautiful, you know, and I, I think I was telling you when I was a kid, I'd for some reason thought that that the yearling was for for boys or that it was religious or something like that. I didn't understand the quality of the writing. And it made me want to ask both of you, do you think that your authors were writing books for children? How do you understand who they're writing for? Maybe I'll start with you, Anne, because I've just talked mm -hmm. about your book, but then Leslie. Well, the book was intended as an adult novel. Um, the idea really came from Maxwell Perkins, uh, uh, Marjorie's editor, who said, um, by the by, uh, a few years before she began this book, how about a, how about a book about a boy in the, in the swamp? And, oh, yes, maybe, and she was working on other things. And finally, she came around to it. And um, it, it was always intended as an adult book. It's a, in the book, Jody, the main character, um, comes of age uh, through a difficult uh, act he must commit toward the end of the book. Uh, but it's it's beautifully written. It's 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 not for kids. I, it could be for kids. Um, I remember teacher read it to us, but <laughs> I remember she kept on writing to her editor. I almost said emailing her editor, saying, "How old is he supposed to be?" And he said, "It doesn't matter." You know, because no. yes, it was a boy, but it wasn't for eight-year-olds. It wasn't like now writing for a certain age group. Um, right. Do you think that people, what book do you think people are most aware of hers? Do you think it's this one or Cross Creek or what What book do you think, have you heard people talk most about? Mo mostly The Yearling. It's the one book. If I say to someone I'm writing about, I have said many times, I'm writing about, about Marjorie Kenan Rawlings. Oh, uh, I say The Yearling they get it. Even if they haven't read the book, they've heard of it. Mm -hmm. And then um, a close second would be Cross Creek, the nonfiction chronicle that she wrote um, uh, about. Is that the one that got her sued? Uh, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and, and, and Leslie, so Harriet the Spy, I read that in sixth grade and I, I thought that Harriet was very mean. <laughs> I, I, I was kind of scandalized by it or, or, or something like that. And I guess I'd always thought that Louise would be a forbidding person. And that's what your, your novel, I'm sorry, your biography opened her up for me and made me understand the paucity of my imagination uh, because she had such close friendships. But I was wondering, I mean, is this a book for children or what do you, what kind of allure does this have? What do you see this? Uh, the, the ethos in this book being? Um, I think it is a book for children. In fact, Louise had a, a very direct connection to the 11 year old mind. That was the age that she loved most. And, um, and I think she felt that uh, she could tell there was a certain honesty at that age in girls. And she, um, she did have a lot of friends. She didn't mind adults. Uh, she didn't have a great relationship with a lot of, there weren't a lot of children around her, but those children who were around her, she had wonderful rapport with. And she always felt that she understood uh, 
what it was like to be 11. Having said that, um, she came off a very difficult moment when she started to write Harriet the Spy. She really wanted to be accepted as an artist, um, a painter, and, and also someone, she eventually did lots of drawings and satirical drawings, but um, she wanted to be a painter in New York in the 1950s, the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, when abstract expressionism was, you know, was having its moment and uh, she was not an abstract expressionist. She was a portraitist and later she was, um, and, and well, she was just an original. Um, In your I'm, book, you I'm, write I'm, about, you write about how she had actually thought the higher form of art was being a poet, you know, yes. uh, and, and she was very concerned about really touching the acme of Olympus. Like she wanted to do the thing that mattered most. Um, and yeah. I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about her friendship with her advisor, James Merrill, the poet at Bard, and, yes. and also her uncle, Peter Taylor, who brilliant novelist, uh, summoned yeah. to Memphis. Did I that mean, influence her ambitions? Absolutely. When she was young, uh, Peter Taylor was the greatest influence on her life. She came, you know, she was growing up in Jim Crow, um, Memphis, and, uh, and, and here's this incredibly um, articulate, intellectual young man. He's only, you know, he's like a decade older than her. Um, he, his sister married uh, Louise's father, so he comes into the household and he suddenly becomes this incredible influence and, um, and opens her up to all kinds of books and the world outside of Memphis. Um, so that was really influential. And he was the person who recommended that she go to Bard. First, she wanted to go to Kenyon College, but she was absolutely disgusted when she discovered that Kenyon did not accept women. Oh. Um, so she, Bard did. And in fact, um, it was, well, I mean, it, it, it had a, an amazing, it had an amazing moment. Bard was accepting emigres from Europe. It had, um, you know, uh, just a, a wonderful faculty. I won't go into that now because there's so much to talk about. But um, she ended up at Bard and, um, and it turned out that um, it was the first semester that, that James Merrill, who she called Jimmy, um, was teaching there. He had decided, <laughs> sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> We'll throw dog here, as was Marjorie. That's Laura. Um, so he had to, um, he was trying to get himself, his brain out of the urban world. And he just thought that going to Bard would give him this moment of peace and serenity. He wasn't correct in that because he didn't know what teaching would involve. Of course, those of us who are teachers know that that has nothing to do with serenity. And anyway, so she um, showed up in his first class with a villanelle. And, um, and, and they just had this rapport and it was they had a lifelong friendship. In fact, she didn't write letters uh, at all to, I mean, she wrote very few letters, but she did have a lifelong letter writing correspondence with him, so. And he did fall in love with her. Yeah. Which was kind of yeah. surprised since they were both gay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so, um, but yeah. so, no, I, I know because I have read your book, how, how, passionately you 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 embraced the book Harriet the Spy when you were a girl growing up in the Bronx and I guess Long Island um but can you can you tell me like you even got egg creams do you think that you had egg creams in the same diner where Harriet did what possessed you to uh first of all what possessed you to write a play of Harriet the Spy or was it a musical oh, uh, it was a play. yeah <laughs> and and how long have you been wanting to write about Louise that's you okay so there's two so questions yeah, it, it is. I have to say that when I was a, 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 a I was born in the Bronx and I grew up on the, oh, at not the Queen, sorry. End, of, end of Long Island. I grew up in Riverhead, Long Island, uh, Suffolk County, and um, and not very far from where Louise had uh, in Quag, where her, she had a summer house. Now, I did not have to be honest with you, I did because I'm exactly the same age as Harriet the Spy. You know, I I was 11 wow. when she was 11. I missed the book until later in time. Ah. Yeah, so it wasn't until I was working as a playwright and the Children's Theater of Minneapolis invited me to write an adaptation of it that I discovered her, thank God. And um, <laughs> after that- That was that, in the 80s, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and I was selected by the estate 
to write the um, to write the play, which I'm really happy to say has been seen by hundreds of children. So many kids have enacted, you know, they've been able to be sport or they've been able to be Janie or, or Harriet. And, um, and, and so that's, that's just like been an in incredible benefit of my in involvement in this book. Um, but when I discovered the book, I never let go. So it was, I did a biography before this, which I always think of as my, you know, my practice biography. I wrote a biography of Lou, of, of Jessica Midford. And- um, What fun. I, it must have been fun. fun. It was super fun. Um, I learned a lot and I hope I was able to apply that knowledge to, to this one. Well, um, I, I want to ask you both how you went about researching your books because I there, I know you did it very differently. But, <laughs> but first, um, so Anne, how did you come by your interest in Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings? Was it mm. a yearling or something else? What took you to her? Well, initially, I, I grew up in Florida. And um, uh, when I was in fourth grade, I had a, uh, a teacher who read the class, the yearling, uh, the yearling to the class. Every day after lunch, we would get another part of a chapter. So some weeks passed and, and we heard the entire book. And I'll never forget it. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, a lady who was a native of Florida. She was elderly. Um, she might have been a character in the yearling, except that, you know, we were. Did she speak that weird accent that, it, that the dialect that Marjorie writes in? Not quite, but it was soft and southern and beautiful, and you could almost fall asleep, although I, I didn't. Um, uh, so I was interested there because it was just such a beautiful, beautiful book um, to a nine year old. Um, and then later on, as an adult, I read the yearling again, I read Cross Creek. Um, which I fell in, fell in love with as well. Um, it wasn't until um, hmm, about 10 years ago that I began to read her other books. And it was also around that time that um, I met um, a, a couple who, um, who, who loved Rawlings. The, the husband had grown up in the same part of Florida as I had a little before. And he had all of Rawlings and lots of books about Florida and his wife knew it. Um, when he passed away, she called me and gave me all his Florida books. And not long after that, she called me again and she said, um, I think there needs to be a new biography of Marjorie and you're the one to do it. And when did it, you start working on it? Um, like eight 20, years ago? 2014. So I, it's been a, you've, that's a lot of work. So, mm -hmm. um, and I, so you were presented with essentially a library of, of volumes. How, how did the research go? What, what, what made it hard or what made it easy? Um, they, they, the answer is the same for both. <laughs> uh -huh. um, what made it, e it was never easy, but I never, it never felt like it was hard. Um, uh, the University of Florida Smathers uh, Library has all of Marjorie's papers, everything she left uh, in Gainesville to the University of Florida. There are more than 4,000 letters, for example, all of her manuscripts, dribs and drabs, little scraps that she wrote. Um, little, and she wrote a lot, right? She wrote she, a lot of letters? Mm -hmm. Yes, wrote and, and received many. The, the archive is vast. And, and the day I called there to, to um, find out if I could come and visit, the archivist, Flo Turcott, uh, said, well, come on over, it's one-stop shopping here. And she was right. There were all this material to be um, mined. Um, so when, but over the years, as I, you know, I made visit after visit to Gainesville, usually from a week to three weeks um, at a time, I found other sources and did a, a, quite a bit of traveling to find more work of hers, some of her early newspaper work, um, letters in other libraries, uh, but, I thought it was fun every minute of it. So you could say it was hard, but. So I, I, I knew that she had such vast correspondence. Uh, she was friends with uh, Thomas Wolfe and with uh, what was the woman who uh, wrote the book about Florida, wrote the 12 dedication chapters. She got the Pulitzer a few years after. Right, um, yes, and I'll think, I'll think of, um, I know Flo Turcotte is here and she'll, She'll tell me. Um, I've written it down. Oh, you know, she's from Ellen Glasgow. Ellen, Ellen Glasgow, Glasgow. Yeah. right. Yeah. But then yeah. also she was so gregarious. People would drop by her house and she would say, if they come at lunchtime, I've lost an entire day's writing. 
and she would do cooking for them. And there was a wonderful uh, quote I found that she gave where she said, you can criticize my writing, that's fine. You criticize my food and uh, you know, I will, I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll be after you with a ice pick or something. But so, um, but so it sounds like you had a wealth of information. Now with Louise, it must have been harder, Leslie, because she was so secretive. You know, we now write about the fact that she was gay and she was kind of out, but she was not publicly out and she was coming out with children's books. So how did you, am I right that she was secretive? How did you get enough material? And you had so much material in this book. It's amazingly well researched. So such rich information. How did you get it? Okay. So, um, I was really fortunate. Um, first of all, I have to say that there's no public archive of Elizabeth of, um, of Louise Fitzhugh's work. And um, her paintings are all held in private collections. Um, in fact, when I first started to work on this, I, I was just sort of Googling around um, and I discovered a painting for sale on eBay for $250. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy it. Why didn't I buy it? <laughs> oh, oh no, oh no. I wasn't there the next time I looked. <laughs> but I, it was, I, I, that's just to say that, so I started this five years ago. Um, the only letters that she has that are in, in collections are, she has a collection, um, uh, letters back and forth with Lorraine Hansberry, who became a very good friend uh, in the years before Hansberry died, and also James Merrill, who she wrote to for her entire life, as I said. Um, so she didn't do have many letters. She didn't like writing letters. She kept a sketchbook. And um, she kept, uh, there was a mysterious diary, I was told, that her estate has. I should say right away that her estate has insisted on her privacy. And, um, and so they were not... Uh, is her estate through her last lover, Lois? Lois, yes. Uh -huh. And now oh. Lois's daughter uh, is the executor of the estate. And they said that Louise always wanted to remain private. And so they were not, um, you know, they didn't, they, they didn't put up, I mean, they didn't uh, resist my, my book, I have to say, but they didn't, uh, they weren't encouraging um, of, in terms of a lot of across the board. I don't even know what to say about that. Let's move on about the estate. <laughs> um, right. No, but it's interesting because, you know, when you think that we love Harry the spy for saying such revealing things about her own thoughts of other people, mm -hmm. uh, psychologically, something interesting is going on there. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I, I mean, I, that's a whole evening of, of discussion, you know, why, why is the estate the way they are? But, you know, you, we have to, Go but one, one thing that really surprised me is reading your book was just discovering her privileged life. She grew up in the Jim Crow South, but her family were millionaires in Memphis. You know, they had hired help of every kind, and so did Harriet. And that also made me think of Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, because she was in Jim Crow, Florida, and mm -hmm. she thought that she had a really good relation with her help. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, But, you know, this is, this is the 1930s and 40s and 50s and and so forth um and and there's such a consciousness of civil rights in uh louise's books uh and i know that uh i know i know that uh certainly marjorie struggled with that i yep. mean do you do you, do you think both of them do you have an idea of how you think both of them dealt with uh well race in the jim crow south what was what were they how do you see their books as picking up on that or addressing it or their lives uh, hmm. maybe leslie well, okay, so um, Louise couldn't wait to get out of the Jim Crow South, and um, I think that Peter Taylor was an influence in that and helping her with the breadth of her reading, and she was able to apply that to her own life. She also knew she was queer early. She was dating women in, uh, in high school. She just wanted to get out. Um, she understood what it was like to be uh, an outsider, to be a misfit, but she was also incredibly rich. And so um, that was a sort of insulation all her life, but it was also a very a difficult thing for her, her life, all her life, because she was she understood the indulgence and, and she understood the privilege. And it was very hard to, um, to give that up. It was very hard to go without when you have it. And at the same time, she really recognized the danger and the, and she abhorred Jim Crow. And um, she called Memphis a sewer. Um, she tried, in many of her works, almost every time uh, she wrote something, she would um, 
uh, give a little dig about racism. Um, she, I mean, well, in, certainly in her, her last book, Nobody's Family is Going to Change, a yeah. black upper middle class family on the Upper East Side, and the daughter's name is Emma for Emancipation. Right. I mean, uh, do you want to talk about that book a little and how remarkable <laughs> that was for 74, I think, 73 yeah. it came out? I mean, she was part of the discourse on liberation movements. Louise was very much opposed to the war in Vietnam. She was supportive of the various liberation movements. However, she she did that. It was the kind of uh, work she did from her home. She wasn't a person who went out in the streets. Her friends noted that. She would always give money. She was always generous. But this was another issue about she's extremely shy. And she also didn't want to change her clothes for anybody. She didn't want to be judged. She, that's one of the reasons why she didn't do readings, why she didn't do, go out into bookstores. She just wanted to be herself. And she had had it with being assessed and evaluated by the world. And she had the privilege of being able to do that. Of course, for us, it means there are no, you know, there's no recordings, there's no films, there's no transcripts of how she spoke or what she said. Um, it's stunning, really, how little of um, considering, you know, our footprints today, how little she uh, she showed herself. But, but as you said, she did keep these sketchbooks. And I, I wanted to show people because you send it to me some of her remarkable art so we can understand and and please fill fill them in better than i am than i am doing now but my understanding is that she uh was moved to write the story of harriet pretty much when her solo show didn't do so well like she wasn't getting enough success at art is that right or not so much yeah i mean she it wasn't happening quickly enough but moreover um at this estate um this read this gallery show which you can see in the bottom left uh -huh. um that's one of her satirical drawings it's a very large drawing um and of a, a cowboy she liked to do photos of i mean paintings of and drawings of um kind of uh kind of archetypical yeah, american archetypes or, yeah and um and so she just felt that the, the gallery owners cheated her. She hadn't really paid attention to how much they were going to take when she made her contract. She just really was excited about having a one man show, as you called it. And that's what well, she, she called it. it. This is yep. her first one man show. Yeah. Absolutely. So. And uh, and she just was sho shocked ha at how little money she made because they sold everything, but they didn't give her much. Um, the other, uh, do you want me to go? Uh, so Suzuki being the first book, that's a picture of Louise on the it's on my left with Gina Jackson, who is also from Tennessee, a photographer. Uh, they were very good friends early in the New York experience. There's Harriet, a drawing of Harriet. So if you go to the right, that's um, Macduff, who is a cat who, Louise loved her cat. She, she loved dogs. She loved a lot of things. Um, you know, she loved her musical instruments. She loved her cars. If you go down, that's a, 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 an illustration called um, uh, two two saleswomen discussing God. That's what it's <laughs> it was. It was in an exhibit that was later reviewed by T. Grace Atkinson, of all people. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. When T. Grace Atkinson first came to New York, she reviewed Louise Fitzhugh. I love all these connections. And then the, when you come to the bottom there, um, maybe, Liesl, you can explain what that is. Yes. And so you know, when I was reading this book, I was really taken the, by the idea that well, Louise Fitzhugh was a conceptual artist. She was doing with her words, the nasty words in capitals, the same thing that Jenny Holzer does when she puts up her sayings on the side of walls. It's a kind of philosophical communication of ideas. Um, and I then began to I reread this book. And there's a section where uh, Harriet is furiously taking notes and spying on this really class insecure snobbish couple who are afraid and they're bourgeois and they're they're hosting an opening well they bought this this hideous gigantic wooden sculpture by well hideous i say that advisedly uh, it's a sculpture a feminist sculpture by i don't remember she's from south america or central america marisol uh but it's it's making it's it's called baby girl and it's about the essentially the the commercialization commodification of girls and womanhood and the ideals they have to live, live up to and so i didn't know that that was a real piece of art that is mocked and caricatured in the book and so when i saw when i when i was reviewing your book i, I there's like a 30 page monograph i read online someplace all about the serious art, artistic intent of louise fitzhugh 
And I just thought that that baby girl uh, looked a little bit like one of those gossiping saleswomen, <laughs> uh, but sort of it interested me. But so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, today I bet she would go farther with her art because it would get, it find its audience, you know, but she was as shy as she was. And uh, these are the kind of records we have of hers, her, of her drawings. And um, also, you know, you can see this Suzuki Bean she drew in 61 and Harriet came out in, was it 64? Yes. Yeah. Or five, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she has a different, a huge range. Um, mm -hmm. But we got to see a little of both the things she did. I'm going to mm -hmm. quit the share now. Sorry. Um, yeah, but so I, I did want to ask you guys to talk about the relationship that each woman had with her editor, because each of them had a really important editor. And I thought, Anne, I'd ask you first, because what an editor uh, oh. Marjorie had, Maxwell Perkins. Can you... <laughs> Should I tell a bit about him, or do you want to tell us? Yeah, go go ahead, Liesel. I give the, the brief outline. I'll jump in and talk about Marjorie. Well, he was at Scribner's. He was the editor of F. Scott Fitzgerald, who was a heavy drinker like Marjorie, and of Hemingway, whom Marjorie sort of befriended, but he wasn't. You know, he didn't come and hang out, but she did go visit him in Bimini. Um, I don't. Right. I don't. Anyway, uh, she, and he was also the editor of Thomas Wolfe. And what I was struck by in your book was his amazing care <clears throat> with her writing, and also the news that he had he'd cut ninety thousand words out of look out of, out of Look Homeward Angel for Thomas Wolfe. Just the degree of his investment in the writer's work and their intuition. How did that work? How did that get Louise to the height that she reached? Would you say? I'm sorry, Marjorie. Did, did you, um, yeah. Did I say Louise? I'm sorry, Marjorie. Yeah. Excuse me. Marjorie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well uh, Max was the one who you know discovered her. You, you said uh, she first when she first got to Florida, she sent some sketches to Scribner's magazine. They took them and and uh, she she sent some more writing in, in very short order. Um, Max took her under his wing you know, to, um, uh, to to help her and to encourage her to write her first novel, South Moon Under, which is a, a wonderful novel. Um, so, so there were what seventeen years of correspondence back and forth between the two of them. She was; uh, they discussed the work. He guided her ever so gently. Um, the the idea for the boys' book, for example, took a few months and years to, you know, move her to that. Um, he he knew she would do a good job, and if she once she took it on, she was good. Um, she had a lot of um, affection for young young boys, adolescents, um, not so much girls because uh, the memory of herself at 11 or 12 was um, not happy. Uh, happy All month. surely templed up to please her mother. Exactly, yeah. Um, but she had a good feeling for that, that time of life, that 11, 12 um, age, and, and Max knew it. The, she, they wrote back and forth quite a bit. There are hundreds of letters. And she confessed her her personal life, her her doubts. Her, you can really see the writer's angst um, uh, in in her letters to Maxwell Perkins. And then he is back with just the most wonderful words of comfort and encouragement. And that never pushy, never pushy. He, he was always. Um, well, you say that, but he gave her very specific instructions on how to fix sections. I was amazed that she just, and she would reply, so, oh, how wonderful. Yes, that's exactly what I, she didn't quail. She took those, am I, am I wrong? Have I overstated it? No, you're not, no. When I say he didn't push her, he didn't He didn't say, okay, on deadline, you gotta have this, mm -hmm. you know, by December 10th or anything. The, the work would come, the work would grow organically, but you're right, he gave her specific uh, suggestions. This character doesn't work. This character needs a little more um, uh, filling out. I don't quite understand uh, the relationship between X and Y. Um, perhaps, per, perhaps you might do this. Um, it, it's so gentle and gentlemanly in his suggestions. So there were plenty of suggestions, but very um, uh, helpful. It help, you could help. just feel the, the nuance of the verb edit under his pen and yes. under his mind. Yes. Um, and then meanwhile, uh, Louise, her work was Ursula Nordstrom at Harper and Rowe. Can you tell us about their relationship, Leslie? Sure. I mean, Ursula was, I would say, one of the greatest editors. Um, she had um, 
the fortune, misfortune of being a woman at, in her time. Uh, I'm sure she would have, she did say at, from time to time that she would have liked to have risen, uh, have worked with adult books early on, but then she, you know, she gave everything she had to the to the world that she she created. And she was, you know, as she was excellent. She's outstanding. She understood the writer's mind and she worked with, um, 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 Oh my goodness, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of her great, uh, somebody help me out here. What was her? her Emmy Kerr, Charlotte I don't know. Zalta. Charlotte Zalta, I apologize. Okay, right. it just went right out of my head. Charlotte Zalta. So um, nine pages came in, um, sent to them by um, Louise's editor, I mean agent, Pat Shardle, and uh, Zalta picked up the nine pages and she just, she had no idea what was going on there. She had no, she knew that um, Louise had already written Suzuki Bean. She admired her her images and her paintings, but um, she didn't know what Louise wanted to do with this. And she brought it to Ursula Nordstrom, and Ursula Nordstrom and, and said, "Well, I don't know what it is, but it's great." And we, you know, <laughs> and Charlotte said, "Well, you have to bring this person in because this isn't a book yet, but it could be." And the two of them together with Louise over, you know, six months helped her create Harriet the Spy. Um, and you know. I don't know if she could have done it with anyone else. I, I will say that after that, uh, she was much more confident working on her own and she rejected the kind of hands-on um, editing that Ursula Nordstrom offered. So um, who knows what else Louise might've written. And then of course she died so young. I don't think she was as open to editing as Marjorie was just based on your book. Um, <laughs> now, both of these women wrote books which children have read, even if they're even if Marjorie's aren't always for children, but they didn't have children themselves. And I was wondering if each of you could talk about the balance of personal life mm -hmm. and, you know, household setup and writing that these women carved out, made for themselves. Maybe, uh, Anne, could you start? Because, sure. you know, she was pretty, un pretty surprising. <laughs> she was surprising. If uh, when she moved, I'll, I'll move. You haven't even her. mentioned that she was running an orange grove. That she was supporting herself while writing by running an actual huge orange farm. I, it's probably not called a farm. I'm not a botanist, but it's a grove. It's okay. It counts. She she referred to it as farm sometimes. Um, sure. She she and her first husband moved to Florida in 1928. She had received um, an inheritance. And uh, the, uh, she was tired, both of them were tired of, of the Northeast and freelancing, which is what they were doing. Um, her husband worked as a salesman as well. And, uh, and their marriage was not doing so well. They both really, really wanted to write. And so she bought a, an orange grove, um, Silent Scene. It's a story, why not? Um, uh, her husband's uh, two brothers had already been down in Florida and said, hey, it's, it's really great here. And they'd visited. And so she bought this place and she and Chuck Rawlings uh, thought naively that they would um, sell oranges and you know make a living selling oranges and they would have all this time to write, which um, <laughs> <laughs> who would think that? But, um, but and they, they came, came down, got their orange grove. It was, it was in complete disarray and the farmhouse was a mess and they spent a lot of time in, in their early, um, months there just doing nothing but grunt work, fix, fixing it up and finding, hiring people to help. Um, so eventually, <laughs> uh, South Moon Under, um, Marjorie's first novel was published um, with, with Maxwell Perkins uh, behind it. And it was such a success. It's, it's a beautiful book, beautiful. And uh, the marriage, you know, split up. Chuck went back north and then she settled into the many years at Cross Creek writing. And so her, her schedule was, she, she was there by herself writing with a household staff that helped her. She could not have done any of that without help, um, black and white, helping on the, you know, either in the house or on the farm. Um, and, and so she was running the business and writing, doing both. And it wasn't until the success of the yearling that she could afford then to spend more time writing, to have other people do, you know, more work for her. 
Um, well, I was also interested in, you know, a man named Norton Baskin wanted to marry her and they did get married, but she didn't want to live in, in his hotel. He was a hotelier. Uh, he was five years younger. And she was like, I, 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 she needed her freedom the same way that Louise did. But, you know, she did have staff, uh, uh, you know, but so I was just interested that she was she wanted to be with a man. She wanted to be partnered, but she needed a lot of alone time. Uh, your book is so fascinating. Anyone who wants to see how do you do this? Um, I, I figured out, I think, something from seeing how Marjorie did it. And, and Leslie, in, in, in your book, I was I, it seemed to me that Louise always had so many people, friends and lovers around her, but she was difficult. And uh, could you talk about how her relationships made her career, her writing, her, her work possible? She's even doing art, I think, until the end, along with the writing, right? Yeah. Um, I'd say, well, both these women are amazingly charismatic. Um, I would say Louise, people loved her. They really did. She was a difficult person, but there was always somebody in her life who was determined to cultivate her genius, who felt I'm the person who's going to keep this light going, because often Louise undermined herself. And, um, and so there was always a cheerleader somehow, either a partner or a good friend. And a lot of friends were peeved by that, you know, tired of doing it, but they kept, you know, they just loved her. She was someone who um, they just could see how great her genius was and that they were, it was part of a community of people. Lots of people were geniuses in this community in different ways and they kind of kept each other going. Um, um, I, you know, it's funny, I, 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 there's a couple of questions here that I, I'd love to get to too. I wonder if we're gonna, um, I, I don't wanna break we're gonna off. open it up to questions in just a couple of minutes, um, but uh, I, I did want to ask each of you what surprised you most about your author in the course. Maybe, Leslie, maybe you could say, what surprised you most about uh, Louise? I think it's a, I mean, it's a continuation of what I was just saying. I couldn't believe how much people loved her. I mean, I, I you asked me earlier about my research and I didn't really get a chance to talk. I did 60 interviews at least, um, many, of, and, and then other, then I went back to many of those people several times. Um, and I just, you know, even if they, I'll just read this. Um, uh, Sandra Scappatoni, co-author with Louise of their picture book, Bang Bang, You're Dead, and author, of Suzuki, and, co and author of Suzuki Bean, which Louise illustrated, had some tremendous feuds with her, but they always made up because, said Sandra, their friendship was so worth it. And, and to me, it's like, wow, that's so much of that, that Louise writes about is about love and about friendship. Um, it's just central to, to a kind of worldview that she had. She didn't think, you know, she didn't know if people could ever achieve it, but it's what she wanted. I mean, you, you talked to 60 people, did you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, <laughs> I, so there were a lot of people who, and did they, did, did all of them, did a lot of them really want to talk? Or did you get the feeling that this was something they'd been holding up and love wanting, waiting for the chance to share? Some of them, some of them had, I mean, I was really very fortunate. I'd love to do a uh, shout out to, to, uh, to Karen Cook, who wrote an article for the Village Voice and yes. collected so much of the material um, and helped me out uh, later, offered me the opportunity to see that material. And then there was a, a, an academic book by a woman named Virginia Wolf, who preceded my book. And um, I know it's great, Virginia L. Wolf. And um, and so you know that's where I was able to start. If I hadn't had those, um, then then I wouldn't. You know, I I don't know where I would have been but so i'm really grateful to the the writers who you know who preceded me writing about louise that's it's wonderful it's always you can add more more you got more and so that it's they contribute to the mountain um and Anne, what surprised you most about marjorie oh a couple of things uh, come to mind uh, one is that uh I, I was surprised that she lived as long as she did she had <laughs> Uh, she had, um, her, her health was never uh, quite stable. She had um, intestinal problems and, and she, she drank quite a bit um, and, and got into some accidents. And, and so she was- Car accidents. Mm -hmm. Car accidents, yeah. So kind of rip roaring and um, she'd be on the wagon, off the wagon and, and, and so forth. I just marveled that she continued, that she, was, uh, she, she just kept, living and writing despite this. But, but the other, other 
<laughs> the other intestinal thing intestinal fortitude despite uh, her intestinal problems exactly uh. and what a sense of humor about it too but the other other thing that surprised me it, it was something i learned through the letters um was that she had um a come to jesus if you will about race um having met zora neale hurston she she had um grown up with let's say conventional um, views on race as a white woman in Washington, D.C. and um, conservative parents. And, and she moved to the South um, and sort of accepted what was going on in this small hamlet with um, poor whites and blacks and, and um, employing them, employing black citizens of the, of the hamlet, um, but treating them, you know, as less than um, as, as many people did. She met Zora Neale Hurston in 1942, and this changed her life. Uh, here was a woman of color who was a beautiful writer, excellent writer, intellectually on the same, same level, um, a peer. And so she just, she, she spent about two years um, wrestling with this, going, oh my God, what is, what have I been doing thinking, here's this woman who's my equal, and this is the way I treat everybody. She, she started um, going to black churches, just being around more black people. She, um, uh, she and Zora struck up a, a friendship. And you can see this in the letters, especially to those, those between her and her husband, Norton Baskin, um, where she's struggling with her, um, with her prejudices. You know, I shouldn't be this way, but I am, what can I do? Um, she finally came out on the other side of it uh, to be a, a spokesperson for civil rights. Um, but there was a two, about a two year struggle where she, um, she had to meet, meet herself there. Very interesting. So you got, we got to see how she grows. There's a very moving moment when Zora comes to visit her, I think at uh, the castle at her, or at her husband's hotel, I don't remember. That's and right. Zora lets herself in through the kitchen thinking, oh, she shouldn't walk through the front door. But 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 Norton and Marjorie had talked this through and said no, she's staying with us and she comes in. But you know mm -hmm. we forget that 80 years ago, uh, you know that was still something that people had to overcome and wrestle with themselves to. Yes, I mean every, every book is a capsule of the time in which it emerged. Of course, um, you know. Yeah. Do we have questions from the uh, our, our our readers we here? Do. We do have some questions coming in. Um, the first question is from Nava Atlas. Um, would you want me to read it to you? Is that okay? Um, this one's for Leslie. Um, Leslie, I read Nobody's Family is Going to Change after reading yours. I found it a rather strange and bitter story. I was amazed to find out it grew into a Broadway musical, The Tap Dance Kid, which Louise didn't live to see. Was it altered very much for the stage? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it, um, the the major alteration was that the lead became the young the, it became the story of a young boy who wanted to be a um, tap dancer whose father uh, wanted him to be a lawyer, as opposed to the story of a young girl an eleven year old girl who uh, who writes a children's you know a a, a constitution for for children of liber of liberation and joins a, a children's liberation movement and wants to be a lawyer and who's, these are siblings, the boy and girl, but when the um, uh, the adaptation happened, they decided to make the girl a minor figure and make the story about the boy who wanted to be a tap dancer. Um, it would be a very different uh, musical. As it is, it's a kind of family musical and it's really fun. The music's great and it's super you know, exciting, but it isn't the story that uh, Louise wrote, which was, you know, there was a bitterness to it about uh, a girl's about it's about misogyny and 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 you know overcoming the patriarchy and in, in the end the the conclusion that um, that Emma emancipation comes to is that we just can't wait around for them to love us we have to act ourselves. What what a great question and what great answers, um, and. I, I, there is a question uh, from, um, let's see, I guess uh, Nava was also asking, what book would you recommend of Marjorie's aside from the famous ones? You said mm -hmm. you like South Moon Under, but is there anything else that you recommend? What are the top three? Oh boy. Well, the top three, uh, well, The Yearling Cross Creek, 
south moon under. Um, I, I, off to the side, I say Cross Creek Cookery, which is a cookbook that followed up Cross Creek. Uh, it's a good cookbook and there's a lot of narrative to it and, and characters, people from the creek are, are named and their recipes are, some of their recipes are, are described. But, but her last novel, um, The Sojourner, I'm, I'm partial to, it's not set in Florida. It's uh, set in the Midwest. Um, although I've been to Van Hornsville, New York to see the house um, she bought uh, and, and, uh, and wrote a good bit of that book in, and I swear the setting in Van Hornsville is, is very much like the setting of The Sojourner. That, that novel um, is not about the South at all, um, the but the characters are farm uh, characters. It's inspired by her grandfather, right? That's her right. paternal grandfather, Norwegian or something. Yeah, Traphagen. Yeah, uh -huh. and she, she had gone back to her, uh, to her roots, found some, um, uh, some materials in an attic that helped her, but not, not enough. So a lot of it was um, in, in her imagination. But she had always, from college days, been uh, enamored of the idea of cosmic consciousness, mm -hmm. which was in the air, still is, but it was early then um, with Whitman and, and writers like that. And she had wanted very much to illustrate that, that concept in a novel. I and mean, it's, it's in most of her writing somehow that everything is connected, interconnected, that at some, in some way we are at the mercy of these connections. And it's- That sounds it's a little like Louise. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's probably most explicitly um, expressed in The Sojourner. Mm. And uh, I, I love that book. So. I, I know I, I do have one question that I want to ask you both is you're both connection connected to musical theater. Leslie, you've been a librettist and Anne, you have an opera that's coming out this month. Uh, maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but um, <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, I mean, and you have a, an opera called The Dreamer based yes. on an original story. Is it possibly based on something to do with uh, Marjorie or no? What? Well, it's based on a recurring dream I had 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, and uh, I wow. wrote wrote it. It's um, uh, wrote it with a composer in uh, in uh, in North Carolina. We had collaborated before. This is my third opera libretto. Um, so, we, and we we wrote it for um, online presentation. It's it's our COVID opera. You know? okay. It could be staged someday, but it's going to be on you know filmed. And, and, and Leslie, you, in addition to doing the play of Harriet the Spy, you are also a librettist uh, associated with the Minnesota Opera and the Philadelphia Opera. That may be a while back, but do you still it do? It was a while back, but I, uh, you know, I, I still dream of writing music for musical theater. Um, um, you know, who knows, right? That's something that may be coming, you know, again. But I, 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 I haven't done that for some time, but I absolutely loved writing libretto for opera. So maybe again, maybe we should uh, collaborate in. I would right. like, yeah. please collaborate. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah. And so what's, what was it like having your books come out in, during the pandemic? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, and, and I, I will go first because Anne's is coming out tomorrow. So we'll have to hear. <laughs> what yeah. to be but I, I mean, mine came out in December and I would say that the hardest thing was not being able to go to bookstores and, um, and, and do signings and readings. Uh, Zoom is great. It has to be, you know, I love it for what it is, but I would love to meet people and to, you know, and to say, you know, who should I sign this to? And, um, so that was a little bit hard and it took, you know, two months before I could actually see a physical book in a bookstore, but, you know, things are coming along. So I'm very happy about, you know, our progress. Anne? Yeah, well, I could give you almost the same answer that uh, originally uh, my book was to be published last fall and then it got moved to February. And I thought, well, okay, so maybe we'll all have vaccines by then, but not, not so. Then it got moved to, April 27th and then May 11th, and I began to think, well, hey, the, the more we delay, the more chance I have getting into a bookstore and signing, but not yet, <laughs> it's not happening yet. Um, I went down to my local independent bookstore um, here in Laramie, Wyoming this morning and signed all their copies. Um, we were all wearing masks, I signed all the copies. So anyone who comes in can get a signed copy, but I won't see those, those people. Um, it, it should open up this summer a little bit, for both of us, um, 
you know, I'm hopeful. I'm but at grateful. least you can be with us this way because we've all gotten used to convening this way. Yes. And so you and Laramie and Leslie in Red, Redlands, California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where everyone else is, but we can meet in this pain yes. uh, and, and, and hear, what, hear, hear the wonderful thoughts you've had and the work you did and be inspired by the stories of these great women authors whom I hope we're all still locked down enough to devote some time to reading. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah. Ryan, are we? Yeah, we are. We are doing great. We're doing. This is a wonderful conclusion. Thank you so much for for answering our questions, and thank you, Liesl, for a, amazing interview and conversation. Get shout out to. Uh, so much. You're so right. thorough. I'm. I'm. In, I'm like. I was taking notes on on how to do it in the future. <laughs> it was so well done. Um, so thank you all so much, and um, I hope everyone has a good afternoon or night depending on where you are <laughs> no <time> here. <laughs> yeah no time but thank you thank you everyone and thank you everyone who came to listen and participate um, it's wonderful. okay thank Thanks you all so, Bye, thank everyone. You so much and congratulations again on pub eve <laughs>